So at the beginning of the year slash end of last year, um, I had a video. It was either my planning video or my priorities video. Editing me will know and we'll put, I probably don't still have the thumbnail. I don't know, whatever. I'll put the video here ish basically to read a bunch of books that like I have owned or have wanted to read for forever I just make it a project of 2023 to get through them so I decided after I posted that video to like make a vlog of it to kind of um, keep myself accountable um, and in the 11th hour I did accomplish that feat so um, this vlog will be me reading the books from that video um, quick refresher so you don't have to go back and watch that video. I should make you watch that video. But no, I won't make you watch the video. The, the books were, if you want the reasons for the books being, I guess on the list, go watch the video. But they were this books two and three from the Inheritance Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. The Unlikely Escape of Your Eye Hate by H.G. Perry. The Essex Serpent by Sarah Perry. Um, Leviathan Wakes by S. James S. A. Corey, Demon Voices by Philip Pullman, Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel, When Women Were Dragons by Kelly Barnhill, Jade Legacy by Fonda Lee, The Ninth Reign by Jen Williams, The Secret Commonwealth by Philip Pullman, and The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. And without further ado, here is a year of me getting through those books. The Essex Serpent. I hated it. Oh man. What a freaking letdown this was. I tried so hard to like it too. The whole time I was reading it, I was like, any minute now I'm gonna fall in love with this. Any minute now I'm gonna like see the point of this. And it never happened and I freaking hated it so much and I finally admitted that to myself. It was so hard to like read it and feel this like, no, I like it. I, I'm sure I like it. I'm sure I will like it. And any, any, any minute now I will. And like, once I accepted that I didn't and I stopped trying to make myself like it, stop trying to convince myself that I do. I was like, no, it was awful, it was terrible. This and this and this, stop, no, it was bad, it was bad. It was so liberating. Um, ranting is so awesome. So like, um, half, part of the reason why I was so committed to liking it is because, okay, cover gorgeous, like 10 out of 10, no notes. I love this cover, books should look like this all the time. Um, actually, does the naked book look pretty? I have no idea. I don't think it does. It does not. But the end pages look pretty nice. Anyway, yes, love the book, like aesthetic. And the adaptation of it, I was determined to, to watch and to like. And I also, I, I did start it, um, and I will not be finishing it, for not maybe the reasons that you would think. <laughs> it's kind of weird why I'm not gonna watch it. Hey, stop it. So, is my camera crooked? What's going on? Anyway, um, okay, so The Essex Servant upside down. The Essex Serpent. <laughs> Cass, what is wrong with you? What are you doing? Cass, what do you want? You want my attention? You have it. It's very cute. The Essex Serpent. It's, it's so bad. Okay, okay. Where do I start? It's historical fiction, which I knew. That's fine. It takes place... When does it actually take place? 1893. There you go. Can't get more specific than that. Well, you could. You could know the month and the day. Anyway, it's um a youngish widow who is interested in like natural science and stuff like that. And she hears about now now that her husband is dead, it's just her and her kid and, and this this very close personal friend of hers that's a female. So she's, you know, got money and, and liberty. And she hears about um in Essex there's this town where there is a legend about this serpent, but people think they were seeing it. They people think it's around. And she's like, I bet it's not like I bet they're seeing something, but I bet it's not this mythic serpent. Maybe it's even a new species. Like I'd like to go investigate, check it out. There's a doctor that is in love with her and it, he treated her husband who then died that's why she's a widow and then so when she goes to Essex like friends of friends or whatever like tell her or, or introduce her to the local um like the minister of the church um is, that, is it called a minister curate priest not priest not catholic vicar vicar is the word cuz what is the matter with you um so she meets and is introduced to and stays with the family of this vicar um, he has got a wife and kids and yeah. Um, so she goes there and, and is trying to figure out what's going on with this serpent and the vicar is dealing with like 
the trying to be a good shepherd to his flock. She's like pretty agnostic slash atheist. So she's like, well, what if I tell you I don't believe in God? And he's like, okay. Um, I obviously do believe in God, but you know, do you? But she's just such a modern woman. So he, you know, falls head over heels in love with her, even though he's got a beautiful, kind, devoted, wonderful woman as a wife, who he very much loves. And his wife has consumption, which we learn over the course of this book. And the wife of the vicar in this book was done so dirty, not just by like the characters in this book, but by the author of this book. Oh, I'm so mad. Okay, so Cora, that's her name, right? Yes, Cora, Cora Seaborn, is the worst. I hate her. And it's not like um, a story where you're supposed to hate her. You're clearly supposed to like her. And I am so sick of, first of all, anachronistically modern attitudes from historical women because that makes them hashtag feminist. It's like women had independent thoughts, women had independent feelings, women thought that they were being mistreated even, women were intelligent, women sought out opportunities for education long before, you know, modern understandings of feminism came into common parlance. So having a woman walk around and be like, and just acting like she has first of all, modern day attitudes about these things, like not just thinking women should have rights and should have equality and should have access to education and should be listened to and should be taken seriously. Like that's all fine. Um, women have thought that for centuries. But to speak about it in ways that one, that we do now, and two, to act like it's an assumption that everybody, like, that it's, that they are surprised and act like it is unusual to find someone that doesn't feel that way, if that makes sense. Because like, society was much more patriarchal. Like, just the laws on the books were more patriarchal. Like, you didn't own property, you didn't have access to education. Like, that was just how it was. So like, being surprised and shocked that somebody wouldn't think that women should have those things when like, no one thought women should have those things. That was the problem. You know what I mean? Like, it's like a modern person being transported back in the day and being like, what do you mean women don't get educated? Like, you know what I mean? Like, you can think that that's wrong, but acting surprised that society be like this when it's been that way your entire life, it's, it, it doesn't ring, like, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's super modern and it doesn't like fit the time period. And it also, it often creates these, these conversations that are like, this is not even how like issues of feminism work nowadays. Kaz, why are you eating your kibble right now? You're so noisy. Like, so people talk about, oh, like feminism isn't an issue anymore. And the reason they say that is because like, well, you do legally have the right to vote. You do legally have the right to own property. You do legally have the right to like work the same jobs and make the same money that men can. You can hold all the same offices they can. There's nothing you can't do. So what do you mean? Like, how can feminism still be an issue? Or how can people still be sexist? Um, because like men don't go around saying you're a woman and therefore you're stupid. So fe sexism is over because sexism is a lot more insidious than that. Sexism is a lot subtler than that. And books like this will have these types of situations where a character is like, but a woman can't. And then our hashtag feminist main character will be like, how dare you think that? Just because I'm a woman, you think I cannot do this? I have a brain. I have thoughts. And it's just like, that's not that's not what feminism looks like. That's not what misogyny looks like. That's not what uh, sexism looks like. It's it's almost never that on the nose. If it, It's honestly a lot... I wish sometimes it was that on the nose because it's a lot easier to call out. It's a lot easier to say you're being sexist right now because you literally said you are a woman, therefore you can't. Like, ding, 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 we have a sexism. So sexism is <laughs> way subtler than that. Even back then, but certainly in the modern day. So... It's just like, I'm just like, what is the fucking point of this? Like whenever a book does that, I'm like, who is this for? What point are you trying to make? Are you, are you illustrating feminism for people who don't understand feminism? Because I guarantee you this won't help. And if you're doing it for people who do know, then those people do know that it is a lot more subtle and insidious than this. So who the fuck is this for? Anyway, that aside, we're supposed to root for Cora because she's a hashtag feminist modern woman in the olden days where she's gonna go her own way. She's gonna study, she's gonna, whatever. And that's why you're supposed to root for her. Because in actual fact, she's actually a terrible person. She's cruel. She manipulates people. She takes people for granted. She's a terrible mother. Um, she's just an awful person. But the book doesn't frame it as like, oh, how complex. Or like, this is a complicated main character. Or like, no. Everyone's in love with her, falling head over heels for her. Like, you're supposed to think she's great and independent or whatever. And she's... She's not. She's awful. She's like, she's like 
the female equivalent of the main character from Norwegian Wood. It's not that bad. It's really not that bad. But, um, okay. So, like, I guess mild spoilers, but you can see the writing on the wall for this, like, the moment you start reading it. So, like, I don't think it's that big a spoiler. She, like, you know, starts fucking the, the vicar. And, I mean, she's not married. So, like, I guess that's fine for her. She's a widow. She can do whatever she wants. But he's married. And his wife's still alive. And has consumption. And she's, like, kind and patient and loving and beautiful. And he loves her very, very much. And she loves her children. She loves her husband. And she just wants him to be happy. And she doesn't want to be a burden. She doesn't want her illness to be a burden on anyone. And what is he doing? He's fucking this horrible character named Cora, who's just shown up and been like, I'm feminist. Therefore, I'm the main character. And I'm great. And you should root for me. And it's like, but why? That's not the only I mean, she also, while she's fucking the vicar, she's like leading by the nose this doctor who is in love with her and very obviously in love with her and writing her letters and like, she like toys with his affections and uses him and manipulates him and just like leads him along because like she enjoys his attention. And when he asks for more and is like, look, I, I don't know if you'll ever be in love with me, but like, you got to know, like I am in love with you. And she's just like, how dare you ask for more of me? You can have what I give you and like, be happy with that. Like, that's literally what she says to him. And he doesn't take it super well. And, and she's just like, oh, darn, like, I guess that upset him. I feel bad about that now. And it's like, Great. And then her female, like, best friend, who's also clearly in love with her, she, again, she just kind of, like, strings along, uses her, uses her for her own comfort, um, doesn't, doesn't reciprocate, isn't kind, doesn't show any gratitude for that. Her, her son, it's clear in the novel that he's coded as, like, being in some way neurodivergent. It's, that it's not clear in what way, because, of course, we, they wouldn't have had a name for it back then if they'd bothered to diagnose it at all. But it's like said over and over again, you know, that he reacts to things strangely or unusually. And then Cora, when when people are like around her son, she's like, oh, he's a little different. Um, like he doesn't react the way you would think that he would. But she like doesn't try to engage with him or try to understand him. She's just like, he's weird. Um, I don't know what to do about that. And then like when he does kind of like show an interest in something, she's like, oh, okay, well, for once you're fucking interested in something. So cool. But she's just mostly neglects and ignores him. And it's like, well, he's weird. So what do you expect me to do? Like, she's a terrible person. I I'm just like, <sighs> if she was like terrible, but interesting, because like there's a, a lot of flaws and I've never read the book, but Gone with the Wind, Scarlett O'Hara is a terrible person. She's a terrible person, but she's coded that way. When you're watching Gone with the Wind, you're supposed to go, oh my gosh, Scarlett, Scarlett. Oh, that's, that's, that's pretty bad. That's pretty naughty. You're quite something. But she's like interesting to follow. And it's clear from the way at least it is in the movie. Maybe the book's different. I have no idea. But in the movie, it's very clear that you're meant to think that Scarlet is behaving in ways that are like not great. That you're meant to go, oh, oh, honey, that's, oh no. Cora behaves like that. And it's painted as like, but she's an independent, free thinking, intellectual female at a time when this is frowned upon. We stand. We do not stand. Cora is the worst. In addition to that, the other characters around her and she even hurts herself. It's just like not very interesting as a character. There's not much to her as a character. It's just like what you do get of her, she's a pretty terrible person. But there's like no deep layered passion between her and the vicar. Cause like, I don't frankly even mind infidelity that much in books. Like I don't, I know some people that like that really, really bothers people that there's infidelity in books. I don't actually care that much. Um, it just all like depends on the situation. In this particular situation, it bothers me a great deal just because of like this specific situation with like who's involved and who is who's the victim of what's going on. But just like infidelity in like writ large by itself doesn't necessarily bother me. It just depends on the, the specific characters. So here, <laughs> it bothered me. Okay, and so then all of that aside, right? So then we've got the Essex serpent, right? That's what brought her here. We have in theory gonna be this like, this clashing of like faith versus science, the clashing of um, empiricism versus um, uh, so, um, superstition. Like having this woman of science versus this man of God. Like that's what this book is gonna be about, right? Except it's not about that. Like we hardly ever talk about the Essex serpent other than in passing as like, that's her reason to be here. And then once in a while we get these like, these moments where we suddenly get poetical about it, but it's like not earned and not built up to, and it's not really affecting anything else in the story. And it's not at the heart of what's going on in most of the story. And we, we have this like grand poetical revelation twist ending related to the serpent that is just, again, totally unearned, just not thematically significant. The like poetical floweriness of the language is really just like, it's just so masturbatory on the part of the author. I 
hated it so much and it feels so good to say that and to admit that because I was like um maybe it's fine it's like it's not fine I hated it so much okay so the adaptation I did start watching it I watched one episode of it and I shan't be watching more um because it fixed these things <laughs> which I know doesn't make any sense but listen 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 <laughs> I didn't say it was rational. I never said it was. I started watching it and I was like, oh, in this show, they are doing things, one, to make Cora seem more like a human being. They're making her have emotions. They're making her pay attention to the people around her. They're showing, like, Claire Danes, the way she plays the role, does seem to care about her son, even if she's not, like, vocalizing it, like, the way that she's interacting with him and looking at him and, like, seems concerned about him. Um, we have, we've already much more strongly introduced the theme of, like, God versus science, of, like, empiricism versus, uh, what's wrong with superstition? <laughs> like, the first episode created a layered, complex situation. It was a little bit of, like, on-the-nose feminism dialogue that's really anachronistic, but it was, like, much less, and it was, like, more tastefully done. And it, it did... The, like, brooding sinister... Because, like, at no point does the Essex Serpent stuff feel, like, brooding or sinister. Ever. There's no atmosphere to be had. Just zero. So there's already in the first episode of the show a great deal of atmosphere and tension surrounding the serpent. And you can see why the vicar would be, like, having this struggle with his people that are, like, fairly afraid of it and really superstitious about it. There's already quite a connection that's pretty apparent between her and the vicar when they first meet. Anyways, what I'm saying is the show seems to already be fixing all of this in the very first episode, and it made me mad <laughs> that people would watch this and give the author credit for it. I know, I know. That's not a rational reason not to watch it, but it just made me mad. Because the entire time that I was watching the first episode, I wasn't enjoying it. I just kept going, yeah, well, if the book had done that. Yeah, well, if the book had had that. Yeah, well, if Cor had been like that in the book. But she wasn't. It didn't. That wasn't there. And so I was just getting angrier watching the show because it kept reminding me of how none of that was in the book. So yeah, I will not be watching the rest of the show because it's, it's much better than the book, at least in the first episode, it seemed to be. Costumes, beautiful. Sets, amazing. Score, great. So yeah, N no, no. <laughs> hated this so much. Okay, I'm done. That's it. See you for the next book. Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel or Mantel. Twice winner of the Man Booker Prize. I hated it. <laughs> this is not going well. Hopefully I like some of the books in this project. Um, but so far, so not good. Um, so... Burp, burp, burp. I, um, I, I truly, I do not understand why this book is popular, why it won awards. Listen, I love Tudor history. Actually, I'm kind of sick of Tudor history, if I'm perfectly honest, because I have seen so many documentaries, adaptations, dramatizations. Like, I'm quite familiar with Tudor history. Like, without being a historian, like, I, I don't claim to know as much or more than Hilary Mantel. She's clearly researched a lot. Um, but I know more than the average person is my point. I know more than the person, the guy on the street about Tudor history. And I found it difficult to follow this and to care about this because nothing is explained. And like, I'm, I'm pretty all for, um, the kind of like immersion method storytelling of like, well, if this character wouldn't think it, if this character wouldn't notice it, then we're not going to hear about it. Um, which is fine. Except that usually necessitates a fairly character-driven story because I'm like, well, I don't necessarily know what's going on, but I'm, I understand what this character is feeling and going through right now, and that will help me to piece together what is going on. We are in Cromwell's head for this book uh, without being, it's not a first-person narrative, although I really feel that it ought to be. And it's told in the present tense, which is kind of weird for historical fiction, but it's not first-person. The amount of times that he is used as opposed to a name makes it legitimately confusing. Like, you do not know who she's talking about because there's a bunch of he's in the room. I don't know if you know this, but history has like a lot of dudes in it. And in fact, a lot of dudes have the same names. Like, because the, they, they, they all just use the same names over and over again in this time period. Not that they don't now, but like even more so because people were naming people after each other as like a way to honor them. So it is legitimately written like so confusingly where you're like, you're doing this on purpose. You could have said who's talking right now instead of he. And there was this like amazing instance of a sentence where like, you literally 
would not know what she is saying because it it's talking about Cromwell but it's it's an it's a sentence that's like on the morning that he was to be executed he went to go see blah 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 now wouldn't you assume that in that sentence it means that the person who's getting executed is the one that's now going to see blah 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 or go do blah 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 yeah well no that's not what that sentence means Cromwell is the one that's the he that's going to go do something so the morning that thus and such person was ex going to be executed, he went to blah, blah, blah. You're just meant to intuit that the he in question is not the he that was formerly referred to in that same sentence. It's Cromwell. Like, why is it written like that? Could you not have used his name? But anyway, like we, we whiz by a lot of events and like it is never explained why these things should matter to us. Like I happen to understand the religious conflict at the heart of this period of history um, and why it's happening and what the sides are and why this is significant and why it would like shatter the nation. None of that is explained. None of that is discussed. It's just assumed that you already know who Anne Boleyn is. You already know about why the church would like be having a fit over what's going on. None of it is explained ever. And so, I mean, for me, at least I do know what's happening and why this is happening because I know history. But because it's not explaining it in the book, then it's very difficult to understand how these characters are feeling about it because usually in a scene where something like that is being discussed or explained, you are getting a sense of how these characters are feeling about it, how these characters are reacting to it. Um, and because that's not happening, then it's just events. Like, I swear to God, the documentaries that I've watched about this time period are more, like, I'm more emotionally invested in them because documentaries do more to dramatize, humanize, and kind of like storyify what's going on than this fucking novel did. This felt like a documentary minus like the interest because at least in a documentary when we learn that Cromwell did thus and such, that Anne Boleyn did thus and such, um, so we're not gonna have a scene dramatizing that because it's a documentary, but you will have historians talking about how, so in this time period, it's actually quite scandalous to be seen doing blah, blah, blah. So the reaction as you can imagine was like this and this and um, there are, we have some sources saying that like there was like these comments were made at the time, which of course would have been quite titillating. And like, they'll add all that flavor and color to it by just kind of telling you about it. And you'll be like, oh, oh yeah, I see what you're talking about or that's very interesting. Here, well, we're, we don't have anyone telling us this stuff because this is a novel, but we don't have any scenes like that either. <laughs> so like, it's literally just the events from history with no color, no personality. And like Cromwell himself, like the events of his life and the choices that he makes and the situations that becomes a part of, it's fascinating. How did you make him boring? How did you make him be a flat, lifeless cardboard character when we're seeing it from his perspective and he's such an interesting person? Like, uh, how, why are we not getting more out of him? Are you that worried about cramming historical detail into this? Because Lord knows she did her research, so we have lots and lots and lots of history in here. But none of it's explained. <laughs> That's the thing. It's not explained. It's just like, these people doing these things, making these decisions, writing these letters. This is a decision. This was the meeting. This was the whatever. Just like a litany. Just a list. <laughs> With no feeling, no emotion, no no narrative, no heart, no no pizzazz. Like nothing. And it's, it's hard to understand, hard to follow, and hard to care about. And also just, again, hard to understand the pros. Who is he? <laughs> Half the time I don't know. So I'm like, I, I just I just don't understand why this is getting praise. And the prose is not that pretty either. When people are like, oh, she writes so beautifully. Where? Where? Like, there are some moments when, like, suddenly out of nowhere, Cromwell starts thinking poetically about something um, or, like, reflecting on something in a kind of purple way. And there are our glimmers. Once in a while, an interaction with King Henry VIII will be kind of a little bit interesting where you're like, oh, we almost had something right there. And then it's gone as very quickly and we're back to slogging through events of history. I just... <sighs> I'm just so baffled. Who is this? Are people just so impressed with how much research she did? And we're like, well, if she researched it that much, it must be good. Irrespective of whether or not it's actually enjoyable to read. Because like, I've said this before about other books, not, not usually quite for these reasons, but like Babel by R.F. Kuang, I was like, go write some nonfiction. Because you are not good at this novel thing. And people love Babel. So maybe the same people that love Babel also gave the Man Booker Prize to Wolf Hall. And I am not those people. I do not understand these people. Because sure, she did a ton of research. There's a lot of, like, she's on display as her knowledge of history. But that does not a good novel make. I, I don't understand. I didn't get beautiful writing out of this. I didn't get amazing characterization. I didn't get lush, vivid historical detail where I felt transported and immersed to this other time period where these complex issues come to life. 
None of that happened. I feel more that way watching a fucking documentary than reading this novel. I don't understand. People say the adaptation of it is really good. And I could easily see, I haven't watched it, I could easily see an adaptation of this being better because it would breathe life into these scenes that are so lifeless, so devoid of characterization. Just by like virtue of an actor being charismatic and like conveying to you how they're feeling with their face. This was not it. I, I, don't, I don't understand. Not only this is popular, but it's, it won awards. I just, I just. So yeah, I own the whole trilogy, both in hardcover and in paperback which is devastating to me because I have no interest in reading the next two books unless someone can tell me that the next two books are like oh yeah she just fixed all that it suddenly becomes a novel she she stops using he so much like if you can tell me all that's fixed maybe I'll give it a go but I doubt it so yeah um did not like <laughs> when women were dragons I DNF'd it <laughs> <laughs> this is really not going well. I, I can tell you that I have started another book on this project. I have not finished it yet, but I'm loving, truly loving that book. So there is, there is light in sight. But yeah, I DNF this because I could very quickly see where this was going and what kind of book this was going to be. And I was like, that's what I was afraid of. And I just have no interest in pushing through with this. The other two, like, I was like, well, I own all of Hilary Mantel's trilogy so like I'm hoping this turns around or like Essex Serpent I was like weirdly committed to liking it and I was like no I'm gonna like this and I'm gonna like the adaptation it's gonna be great and I was just like oh maybe it's because I hated those first two and I'm just tired of pushing through books I hate but okay so I was kind of afraid this would happen but I held out hope that I might not be but I thought very easily this could be that kind of like really on the nose feminism that is just like what is the fucking point of this <laughs> And that's what we got here, except it was like kind of worse than I thought it would be. Now I thought perhaps, the reason I had hope is because, okay, so the concept is like, it's on, it's in the title, when women were dragons. So it's like women becoming literal dragons is like the metaphor being employed. Or like, that's like a, a metaphor for like female rage and like how we don't, uh, female sexuality and how we don't talk about it. And like the dragoning of women is like not discussed, it's unmentionable. It's very clear what it's what the dragoning is doing. And I held out hope that because it's so on the nose and obvious and so aggressive, like there's like no subtlety to that, right? Like literal dragoning. So because it's so on the nose, I felt like it was possible to actually have some quite subtle commentary. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of something that did this. I know I've seen it. Where like, because something is so absurdly over the top um, and we just like lean into that so hard to the ridiculousness of that premise that, well, okay, like Stepford Wives. Stepford Wives, like they're literally robots. Like we're taking the idea of like men wanting their women to like be like dolls, like be like what they want them to be and nothing else, just pretty things that cook for them. And it, it like takes it to this utter extreme of where they're literally like these, these robot dolls which is horrifying and also because it's so so extreme like it it opens the conversation weirdly um to go to places that I, I don't know how to how to explain it but it's like by going so far in that direction um it like passes the point of being on the nose and enters the territory of brilliance I don't know if that makes any sense so like I kind of hoped that yeah like if you're gonna be this on the nose about it then stop pretending to be subtle because that was my big problem with it like the book was acting like we're just telling a normal story and we're going to be subtle about it. And we're going to like, I don't know how to, ex I, don't, I don't know, I don't think, I don't think I'm good, doing a very good job explaining this. I'm like, no, like you have women turning into fucking dragons. Like lean into that. Like lean into just like, um, or, or maybe like, okay, Animal Farm. Animal Farm maybe is a better example. Animal Farm, like it's very clear the commentary it's making, the political commentary it's making, but we're like animals on a farm. And so like, when we have the animals saying that like, oh, we're all equal, but some are more equal than others. Like it's like going so far into that, that it, 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 it's, it's like by being so absurd and ridiculous, it's really actually shining a light on this because you're like, well, we've made this extreme and ridiculous, but what's extreme and ridiculous is the fact that this isn't actually that extremely different from what is really going on. I don't know if that was a better explanation. I think it was. <laughs> so like if people, I don't know, if the way that women dragoning was talked about and handled really, really casually by people um, in a way that it's like, it's even more ridiculous that people would treat that casually than the way people treat women's issues now casually. 
because it's like a fucking dragon staring you in the face. And like how hilariously darkly absurd that would be that, you know, does that make any sense? So yeah, yeah. I guess I'm kind of reminded of um, uh, this line from Neverwhere where it's like um, Richard Mayhew did not believe in angels and he was damned if he's gonna start now, but it was a lot easier not to believe in something when it wasn't staring you in the face and saying your name. So like, if it was like men dismissing women's issues, but it's a fucking dragon breathing fire on them right now. And they're like, nope, nothing to see here. I don't know what you're talking about. Like how ridiculous that is. Then I'd be like, yes, this is brilliant. Like, well done. But instead it's like this like subtle and, and dark and dystopian, like women are dragoning, but no one talks about it. It was the great dragoning, but no one talks about it. And I wasn't allowed to speak to my mother about it. And it was all, it's just like so like serious in this way that it's like missing the point and opportunity of a premise as in as over the top as this one is. And I saw that it was doing that and I was like, forget it. This book is gonna be, it's totally squandering this opportunity to say something in a way that is meaningful or significant or really taking advantage of its own premise. And I just don't care. I've seen this done so badly so many times at this point. Um, this is not like helping the issues of women. It's really not. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just tired of it. I'm, I'm really, really sick of it. So I just was like, fuck, I'm not, I'm not reading this. I'm DNFing it. I don't care. This is not going to get better. I know it's not going to. It's just going to make me angry. Um, and so I DNFed it. I think I mentioned, maybe I didn't, but I was like, uh-oh, Pani Garmus, the author of Lessons in Chemistry, blurbed this. That does not bode well. Lessons in Chemistry, another book that failed in this same way. Um, but I did finish that book. Um, yeah, no. Doop, doop, doop. None for me, but I am, like I said, enjoying the book I'm currently reading that's from this project. So my next clip should be a happy one unless something really, something really goes awry. So yay. <laughs> the unlikely escape of Uriah Heep. So far, this is the best one of the lot because I hated the first three. So it's not a high bar, admittedly. Yeah. So I think again, in the original video, I said I wanted to read this because H.G. Perry wrote The Shadow Histories. And ever since reading The Shadow Histories, I've just been like, well, this was the only book I believe that she had out. This was her debut. Um, and then like, so after reading The Shadow Histories, I like bought her backlist, which is this, and pre-ordered her next book. And I have it now, um, The Magician's Daughter. Any whoosies. I'm happy to report that I very much liked it. I think The Shadow Histories is better, but, and I think that I liked the first half of this better than the second half. I didn't hate the second half, but like when I, in my previous clip, I was like, I'm loving my current read. Um, I was in the first half still and I was like, this is gonna be like five stars. I might like this more than the shadow histories. And that's not the case. <laughs> I think it's like four, four and a half. So still very, very strong. Um, it's just the end kind of got a bit much. <laughs> like I, I think if you've watched my channel for a while, you know that I tend to struggle with like when magic and magical things kind of just like get too crazy and wild and involved and have like too much going on. I have a big problem with that when I read um, Peter Jelly Clark. So. Um, the concept kind of got too big and there was like too much going on by the end um, was what, what keeps this from being five stars for me. But the concept and the majority of the execution, Chef's Kiss, confirms H.G. Perry is an autobiography for me. I uh, love it. And also the uh, acknowledgments or the afterword or whatever it's called. I could look. Anyway, um, acknowledgments also like made me like it even more. So yeah, um, this book, I think from the cover slash premise, like you can gather, it's about literary characters stepping out of the pages of the books they're in. I hadn't, I literally hadn't read any of these blurbs on the back at all until right now. Uh, I, my eye was caught by the words Neil Gaiman. <laughs> it says a rollicking adventure that thrills like Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere mashed up with Penny Dreadful in the best postmodern way. One of your most fun reads this year. I would pretty much agree. Um, so yeah, the in the acknowledgement, she said this kind of an ode to um, literary criticism, which it certainly is uh, evident in the book. So what I did not realize um, going into it was that it would take place in the modern day, which it does. So it takes place in Australia or New Zealand. One of the two. <laughs> I could look. Blah, blah, blah. So the first few pages, I think I want to say Australia, but now I want to say New Zealand. Dang it. Well, it's Prince Albert University of Wellington. Where is Wellington? New Zealand. Or at least that's where the university is. Anyway. <clears throat> Forgive me, um, Aussies and Kiwis, that I mixed you up. I'm a Californian, what do you expect? Um, 
So yeah, it takes place in the, in the present day and it follows two brothers, one of whom is able to pull literary characters out of the books he reads and the other brother who's our main POV is just like a normal person, is the older brother of the brother that can do this. So yeah, chaos ensues. <laughs> uh, when I was reading, when I was like uh, talking to somebody about this when I first started reading it, I uh, compared it to texts from Jane Eyre by Mallory Ortberg, which they are no longer Mallory Ortberg, but that's what the cover of my book says. What are they called now? So much Googling. I should have done this before. Daniel M. Lavery. Lavery? Okay. Anyway, um, the book is Texts from Jane Eyre. And uh, Texts from Jane Eyre isn't all about Jane Eyre, if you've never heard of it or read it. It's like a series of, um, it's like tons and tons of like text conversations. So imagined text conversations between literary characters. So there's like, um, a, a, it's like a ton of them. So there's like texts between Heathcliff and Kathy. Uh, there's text between characters from Greek tragedies. There's text between Shakespeare characters. Um, just like tons and tons. And the joy of reading texts from Jane Eyre is the way that like if you've read or you're familiar with these stories and these characters, the way that it's like paying homage to while gently ribbing and parodying them. And so that's like basically kind of like the vibe of Unlikely Escape. Because there's all these literary characters running around and first it like is a like the first layer of meaning and amusement is just how like it's poking fun of at these characters, right? You know, like that Mr. Darcy living and breathing and walking around, like, you know, it's a character of the ideals of Mr. Darcy and what he represents um, and many, many other literary characters. Um, but the second layer of amusement and meaning is how like these characters are shaped by not just like what the author wrote about them, but how the characters read them. Like that is also present in how they like manifest. So it's like, it's a comedy and literary reference and meaning section. So I just found it like a really joyful experience to read it because of that, because like I was, I felt in on the joke and it felt like it wasn't like a, it's not cruel. It's, it's very like we who love these characters and these books can laugh at ourselves a bit. We who analyze these texts can laugh at ourselves a bit. While also telling like a really engaging, suspenseful, mysterious, like action packed magic adventure story. Yeah, I would highly recommend this. Like I said, it's more just, it's probably more of a me thing too. I feel like most people don't actually mind that much when like books get like kind of crazy and magic-y. Most people actually tend to like that. So I would say most people, well, other people may not like all the literary references as well as I do, but they'll probably like the magic part better than me. So I, either way, I, I'd recommend this definitely. I guess I would say if you're not familiar with, with characters from classics, um, like not at all, I think you'd be bored and confused and unamused. <laughs> um, but like, you don't have to be like a scholar. I think like if you have like just kind of like a vague cursory knowledge where like you could recognize the names. If you have some idea of like who Heathcliff is, who Dorian Gray is, who David Copperfield is, who Uriah Heep, the eponymous Uriah Heep is. If you know like just kind of like the biggies, like if you vaguely know the cliff notes of like who they are and what their stories are about, like you should probably do just fine. It's not that like deep into like exploring each of these characters. Like it's, it's, there's a ton of characters and there wouldn't be time to do that. And that's not really what the book's about. It's kind of in passing um, that you can kind of like laugh at these characters. Yeah, I think it's so cleverly done. Um, I think it's quite heartfelt and heartwarming. And it tells a story that's like, um, aside from all the literary references, like about its own characters that you care about and has something to say in that regard. So I just feel like there's so many layers of enjoyment and entertainment and um, emotion and I, yeah, H.G. <laughs> Perry did it again. I definitely, definitely recommend this book. I think The Shadow Histories shows progress because this was her first. And as a debut, I mean, holy moly, like amazing debut. But I also feel very gratified in the fact that, uh, so in reading the acknowledgments, so um, I've said that people who like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell should read The Shadow Histories, which is H.G. Perry's um, work after this, the What Got Me To Be A Fan, Declaration of the Rights of Magicians, and A Radical Act of Free Magic. I often say, hey, if you like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, you should read those books. So I felt very gratified that in the acknowledgments for this book, um, she actually reference says something about Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell being like one of the inspirations slash... It's, it's mentioned. <laughs> so point being like, I'm not mistaken in like comparing these or seeing a, a similar... You know what I'm saying. I don't know. I completely lost my ability to speak. So yeah, um, I don't have that as much to say about this because I like it. That's, that's, ain't that just the way. I can rant for an hour, but I like something. I'm just like, I like it. 
I have no notes. <laughs> 10 out of 10. So I guess my only note is that the end is a bit like big in the like magic showdown portion that just kind of like gets a little wild um, and untethered. And I didn't really care about that because <laughs> I just like never do. That's just my least favorite part of books as a fantasy reader, weirdly. What I'm saying is it's great. I'm not disappointed. H.G. Barry remains a favorite of mine. And I'm even more excited now to read her newest, uh, The Magician's Daughter. But yeah, definitely, definitely like this. I would not be at all surprised if at the end of this whole project, my favorite of all of the books will be this one. I did only give this four stars, so perhaps that does not bode well, but... Oh no, I do have some Jemison. Okay, Jemison might end up being favorite. Who knows? We'll see. We'll find out together. But anyway, yes, this... Definitely, definitely love it. The Broken Kingdoms by N.K. Jemisin, the second book in the Inheritance trilogy. I, I didn't really like this. At first I did. The beginning I, I was like pretty into it. Not, well, not super into it, obviously, because like, uh, well, I shouldn't say obviously. It's obvious to me because like I didn't, uh, it wasn't like unputdownable. I would say 100,000 Kingdoms was more so like unput downable, as was the fifth season. So like the beginning I was, I was intrigued and then like sort of like, put it aside just because like I was busy with like other obligations and whatnot um and then I got the audiobook from the library because I started reading it physically and then I got the audiobook from the library thinking okay well that'll make things speedier and I listened to at least half of it but like the middle half so like I read the beginning physically then read like you know like <laughs> this much or something uh via audio and I was like I'm really not liking this and then I was like, maybe it's because of the audio. Maybe the audio is just not working for me. Because the beginning, like, I remember, like, mo mostly liking. So then I stopped listening to an audio and read the rest physically. And that helped a little. So, like, I definitely did not like the audiobook. So that's for sure. But it definitely didn't save it. It wasn't, like, as soon as I switched back to reading physically that I was like, ah, oh, yes, there it is. This is so good. I No, I still didn't really like it that much. It, this felt much more, like, shallow and cliche and it's weird to use words like cliche for this because like the the world building and the situation in this book is still quite kind of like out there and and you know connected to the first book which I have to say there were definitely things in here where I was like I feel like I'm supposed to remember this thing from 100,000 Kingdoms and it kind of came back to me as they talked about it but I was like I think I'm supposed to know what it is that they're referencing or that they're getting wrong about this but I can't remember because it was like two years since I read 100,000 Kingdoms. I really liked 100,000 Kingdoms and even though it had like slightly cliche things in terms of like sort of the character dynamics here and there, um, overall I felt like it was really inventive whereas here it wasn't that inventive. It was mostly like cliche and shallow and kind of wish fulfillment-y and the main character was a bit of like a Mary Sue author insert type of deal. Like not the worst I've seen, like definitely not the worst I've seen, but too much of that. And that was mostly what I was getting at. I was like, I'm not feeling like this is a deep and layered and complex depiction of like a complicated, speculative, moral, hypothetical, blah, 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 blah. It felt more akin to like the, what people are getting out of like these like vampire and fey romances with like the immortal aloof dude who's inexplicably in love with like the ordinary human who's also kind of like a super special ordinary human who's our main character so like that was the vibe of it more than anything and like the, the situation like more overall more broadly than just like the main character and her like deal um wasn't that interesting to me um I don't feel like it expanded on the first one in a way that was interesting and it, it didn't I suspect based on how this ended um, I, sp I suspect that I know what the third one's going to be about, or at least who the third one's going to be about. I can't say that thrills me. That's also on my list for this vlog project is to finish this trilogy, which, which means I have to read the next one after this. I have it. I'm definitely not going to listen to an audio because audio is not working for me. Well, I guess I, sh I should check if it's the same narrator. I would imagine it's the same narrator. Yeah, this is a big letdown, which is like, N.K. Jemisin has been like nothing but hits for me because the the Broken Earth trilogy, um, the first one was my favorite, but still the entire trilogy, I was like, mind blown. N.K. Jemisin is on a different level from everybody else. And then 100,000 Kingdoms was like really different from um, Broken Earth while still like playing with some themes that I was like, ah, I think this is, these are just like themes she's generally interested in. Because like, even though the situation of these books is quite different or this book is quite different, um, I can see like 
is, and because she wrote it before Broke on Earth, you'd like start to see her like play with some ideas that kind of like more become like front and center in Broke on Earth. So it was like really interesting to read it kind of like watching the author and how the author's playing with ideas and changing and growing. But for itself as well, 100,000 Kingdoms was really interesting and well-written and really compelling and really kind of like unputdownable. This was like, ah, nope. What, what happened? This felt so bad. And there were so many times when like the conversations, like the dialogue, the like emotional situation felt so like, like a CW show and not in a fun way because I watch CW shows because they're fun. So this was like CW, but taking a CW show that thinks it's on HBO and you're like, no, you're a CW show. So just lean into your camp because you're not actually good. That's how this felt. And it was so painful to feel that way while reading it because I was like, this is N.K. Jemisin. I was like, uh, what? So I'm hoping we kind of like bounce back with the next one because I'm going to read it. But this is like a two stars that I might round up to three because it's like two and a half, I guess. It's, certain, it's definitely not the worst thing I've ever read. Some of the world building is kind of cool, but mostly, mostly not. I don't feel like there was an interesting exploration of theme or character or like world building or politics or anything. Like it was just, I feel like we were only here for the wish fulfillment of the main character's like personal story. And I didn't feel like the main character had a personality outside of like, well, she just didn't have a personality other than like her specialness. And the love interest, if he can be called that, well, I mean, yeah, he can't be called that, but like it's a little untraditional in that sense. But if the, the love interest is has somehow less personality than the main character. And that the fact that I'm supposed to feel some kind of way about these two, like, I don't even have to like feel like romantically about them. This doesn't have to be like a, you know, um, escapist ideal, ideal version of like, oh, if only I like, what an amazing couple, like, like goals, dreams, whatever. Like, no, like I would, I love reading stories about people who are just like interesting and messy and their relationship is complicated while they're in heights. <laughs> um, if you think anything is ideal about Kathy and Heathcliff, no. So, and that was more how I felt about 100,000 Kingdoms, where I was like, this doesn't feel like wish fulfillment to you, or like a romance novel. It feels like this is a really interesting, complicated, emotionally complex scenario. And so like, it's interesting to, to like, uh, contemplate it. Here, it was not interesting or compelling or like, honestly, wish fulfillment to you. It was just, it was just so boring and shallow which again I'm like am, am I am I missing it because this is N.K. Jemisin and everything else I've read from N.K. Jemisin I have been nothing but impressed on, on like basically every level characters politics story world building emotional stuff thematic stuff like I, I was like where is any of that in here so I kind of hated this Ugh, and that really hurts me. So really, really hoping that the third one was the kingdom of gods. Um, it brings it, brings it back again. At the very least kingdom of gods will be benefiting from a, my much lowered expectations. Cause going into this, I mean, I was like, NK Jamison is four for four. Like can't wait to read another amazing NK Jamison book. And I was like, hmm, what? So now, my expectations for Nikesh Jemison are like as low as they've ever been. So going into the kingdom of gods, now I'm like, well, I expect like very little of you now. So you like can benefit by like from that and you can impress me by being better than this. So yeah, I'm, yeah. What an empty reading experience. I just, I felt nothing. I did not feel emotional investment. I didn't feel interested. I didn't feel touched. I didn't feel fascinated. I didn't feel anything. I, I just absolutely nothing. So yeah, that's unfortunate. Hoping it'll get better from here. Well, I finally finished Jade Legacy, meaning I finally finished the Greenbone Saga. And it was just as good as I thought it would be. It was not, um, how to phrase this, because it, a, a lot of, things happened. It was a really stressful reading experience. But the way people talked about this book um, and the like reactions to it um, when it came out and everyone being like devastated and being like, fondly, how could you? And all this kind of thing. I think I was over prepared. 
Um, so I, I'm not disappointed. I didn't think I, I was relieved that things didn't go worse. Um, I really thought they would go worse for the characters. So like, again, not to say things went super well. <laughs> uh, yeah, not to say that things went perfectly or well or everything was actually just like totally fine and happy the whole time. Um, I certainly do not mean that. But yeah, I think I was ready for more devastation. And perhaps I would have felt more devastation if um, I hadn't been expecting it. But I also think, so like it is partly that like the way people talked about it, but it's also having read the previous two books that like, I guess I wouldn't have been over, over prepared like I was, but I would have been prepared, I think for the level of like what we were getting in this because for the final book in this series, I think it's exactly like at the level of like, uh, ratio of tragedy to success. <laughs> um, as I think I would have expected going in with no, going in with no preset expectations other than what I would have from reading Jade City and Jade War. Anyway, Fawn de Lee, amazing. I absolutely want to read anything she writes. Um, I do still have, they're not on my list for this project, um, but I have the Jade Setter of Jan Loon and whatever the other novella is <laughs> that's also in the Greenbone universe. I don't know when I'll get to those soonish though. Uh, Jade Setter is, it's a novella. It's it's short, definitely, you know, compared to this, it's very short. I, as, as predicted, or as I predicted, I feel, you know, like, oh, it's over now. Um, but I don't feel as devastated. I thought I would be both devastated and be like, and it's over. So there's no, like, hoping for better to come. So it's, I'm sad that it's over, but I don't really feel any kind of, like, devastation. I think it was pretty much exactly what it needed to be. Not that I like predicted anything in particular, but like, yeah, like this felt right, um, the ending. So yeah, absolutely. Like now having finished it, yeah. I, I wasn't really, um, I, I, I didn't have any doubts really. Like I was pretty confident in saying the Greenbone Saga is like one of my all-time favorite series and I can highly recommend it even though I hadn't read the third one yet. I did not really like doubt that it would deliver. I was like, worst case scenario maybe I feel like the third one is like you know paced badly or something but I was like I doubt I will read the third one and be like oh man that was such a good series and then she like really dropped the ball with the third one I really didn't think that would happen and it didn't um I would say the only problem I really had with Jade um Legacy if I had a problem was pacing related um and it's definitely not bad or anything I still give this five stars and it's still really 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 good and considering how much time passes and how much happens in this book like it's paced fairly well but so much time passes in this book that we constantly have time skips and it's a little bit like kind of hard to get a flow and a little hard to kind of like feel like you're sinking into like the situation or to like the character like feelings or whatever because every time you like start to sink into the situation they're like and eh, it's been two years and it's been five years and it's been another two years so like I just felt like we were kind of like skipping along and I kind of wish like instead of trying to cover all of this time in this last book that we had lingered more on those moments and made this two books if need be because um, this is already really long so I don't really think you could reasonably reasonably make legacy longer and keep it one book but I would be very happy to have it be two or three books um, just so we could like linger a little bit in some of those moments and kind of see there were several times when there was like a really like life altering paradigm shifting like intense thing that would occur and I would kind of expect to like see the aftermath of that and to see them kind of like grapple with having to deal with the ramifications and aftermath of that and we just didn't because like the thing would happen and it would be like in the immediate sense resolved um, but like and that you can see like long, there's going to be long-term consequences for this that they need to figure out but instead of like watching them figure it out we'd be like it's been five years and then in like five years later while we're learning what's currently happening we also get like the recap of like and that other thing that just happened this is how they that's how they resolved it in the last couple of years and it's like okay like kind of wish I'd seen that but that being said like for that kind of like constant skipping it still kept me hooked and was still paced very well and I feel like for a book that is gonna have to do a lot of telling over showing if it's gonna cover all of that and it like I mean it did tell a little bit more than the show and definitely more than the previous two books for that being the case um it was like still really really good and like the best version of that so like the best version of telling the best version of exposition the best version of like time skipping so not ideal from like the pacing perspective 
but still really, really, really good. Really good. Um, yeah, absolutely worth the hype, the whole series. I think Jade City remains my favorite reading experience. It was the most like sucked in, cannot put it down ever. Oh my god, this is my entire personality now. Um, and the second and third books, love them. But like the second and third books never reached quite that level of like mania for me where I'm like, you know, plan is my blood and the pillar is its what is the I don't remember I don't remember the phrase see this wouldn't have happened in Jane City um <laughs> but yeah I love it love it love it so 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 good so glad I read it and was well I was forced to read it not because I didn't want to read it but because I would have kept kept, kept putting it off indefinitely but my patrons did force me to read it. I mean I would have forced myself to read it this year because of this vlog project so like but I might have like it might have been a December thing instead of like a mid-year thing so anyway glad to have read it uh now I just have to wait for the next great thing because damn all right so I finished another book but when I was going to sit down to film this clip I realized that I never actually filmed a clip for the last book that I read and it has been months <laughs> since I finished that book so um real quick the, to the best of my ability several months back I did read The Secret Commonwealth by uh, Philip Pullman, which is the sequel to The Book of Dust. And um, I really enjoyed this from what I remember from a few months back. My, I, There was something in this book that's quite spoilery, so I won't say what it is, that I, I don't know why it's there. Um, and we don't have a book three yet, and there's no like date or like projection for when we would have a book three. Um, so... I don't know like the point with that being that like maybe they the reason for the inclusion of this kind of weird thing um would become apparent um in the third book <laughs> so far I'm like I don't know why this was necessary <laughs> this is just kind of making me uncomfortable and not in a way where because like Philip Pullman's books um or the his dark materials books in particular they um they often deal with kind of troubling topics in a way that feels like it's intentionally meant to be troubling. Like they like to live in the moral gray. And that's one of the things that I love about Philip Pullman's writing is because it, especially for like books that are kind of more geared towards children, these ones don't really seem to be, but like the His Dark Materials certainly are like sold and marketed at least in part as like middle grade books. I think it's great that like he kind of introduces kind of darker, harder things for um, a kid to begin to contemplate. So I don't mean that like, oh, this book is in the gray and that makes me uncomfortable. Because it is, I mean, certainly it, it's in keeping with the Philip Pullman tradition of doing that. Um, no, this is more a thing where I'm like, maybe that is why it's here. Because he was like, this will make you uncomfortable. <laughs> um, well, mission accomplished, it did. It just, I don't right now see a reason for its inclusion. Like I, I can't think of a reason for including it. It's just weird. Anyway, that being said, it's a relatively small part of the book in terms of like um, page count. Um, this is a pretty long book. It's even longer than The Book of Dust. Uh, or I'm sorry, this series is The Book of Dust. The first book is La Belle Sauvage. A Sauvage, Suva, I don't know how you're supposed to say it, but, and then The Secret Commonwealth is the second book in The Book of Dust. It did leave me wanting to read the book three like immediately. And I was like, as soon as I finished it, I was like, where's book three? Is there I've been an announcement? <laughs> there has not. Um, I think the last update from him was from like a year ago of him saying that like he was hoping in the following year to like finish it and well he has not. <laughs> so. Anyway I, I liked it a lot. It's one of the better books for this whole project. Um, it's mainly just that kind of one thing that was like mm, I don't know about that. But this so if you don't know anything about it so um, La Belle Sauvage um, in the first book in the Book of Dust is a prequel to His Dark Materials. And then The Secret Commonwealth is the sequel to La Belle Sauvage, but it takes place also as a sequel to His Dark Materials. So His Dark Materials, before it is La Belle Sauvage, um, and after it is um, the, this one, <laughs> Secret Commonwealth. Um, but they are books one and two. So book one in the Book of Dust has like a big, 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 big gap before book two, which is this one, which takes place after this whole last trilogy. So it's kind of weird in, in like the timing of that, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I think I don't, um, I don't recommend reading it in, in, in chronological order. I think you should definitely read it in publication order. Like, I don't think you should read first La Belle Sauvage, then His Dark Materials, and then The Secret Commonwealth. 
definitely read his Dark Materials first and then go back to read La Belle Sauvage and the Secret Commonwealth. But yeah, so this book follows a much older Lyra. So Lyra is the protagonist from his Dark Materials and so she's like um upper teenager. I don't think she's in her 20s yet or if she is like very early 20s, but I think she's still a teenager. But she's like functionally an adult, so like she's not a child anymore. Um, so it's much more mature um, than His Dark Materials. And His Dark Materials is pretty mature already. So yeah, it was really, really wonderful to be back in this world. Um, I like prefer His Dark Materials when it's like, I, like the first book is my favorite book, which takes place almost exclusively in Lyra's world. Um, and when we do the world hopping and all the other stuff, there's some interesting stuff in there and I still enjoy the series, but like it loses me a bit. And I think the book kind of loses the plot a bit. Um, but the Belle Sauvage and Secret Commonwealth, they both fully take place in Lyra's world. And I prefer that. So I like being back in the world, but like specifically the world of like Northern Lights or Golden Compass or whatever you want to call it, the first book in His Dark Materials. It feels most akin to that, which is my favorite part of His Dark Materials. This has some like heartbreaking stuff in it, not the weird thing. <laughs> I mean, like there's like, there's lots of stuff in here that is like emotionally complex. So like, I really don't understand the inclusion of the weird thing. Um, but any whoosies, I, I've definitely, definitely enjoyed this and I continue to be a fan of Philip Pullman. But anyway, the book that I read just now, that I just finished, was not great. <laughs> that was Ninth Rain. Um, it won the patron book, buddy read book club thing. So I just read it with my patrons. And I have the Broken Binding editions, which are all stunning with like, um, you know, beautiful, beautiful books. So I wish I loved it. I really, really do. Books two and three, equally stunning. Possibly more stunning because I like the colors better. Um, this was not the worst book I've read. <laughs> not the worst. Um, not the worst this year and certainly not the worst ever. A lot of the times, especially in my patron vlogs, when they like pick a book for me to read, um, that I'm like, eh, I don't know about this. Quite often in those vlogs, it'll be a book that I don't like. But um, in the beginning of it, I'll be like, well, the writing is clunky and the world building is clunky and it's really like heavy on the info dumping and expository dialogue, but I'm willing to forgive those things if it turns out to have like a worthwhile plot or some worthwhile world building that like it won't be a, it it will still lose points for the bad writing, but I can overlook bad writing if it's doing other things exceptionally well. And I'll say that a lot about books, but then like nine times out of 10, when all is said and done, I'm like, well, it'll, it, it sucked. Like it didn't have good enough world building or good enough plot to like make up for the bad writing. Um, this was the rare example where it did have some good world building and some interesting things with the plot and characters. Um, but like a lot of the, what my patrons and I talked about was that there was so much missed potential and missed opportunity. And I'm so sorry for the noise. There was like a festival in the park next to me yesterday and I think they're doing it again today, which is devastating. Anyway, to quickly wrap this up because the noise is getting worse and I'm sure you can hear it. Oh my gosh. Um, so much missed potential, missed opportunity, missed everything. Like there's there's the seeds of some really complex, interesting character work and world building. That is why I still give it credit. I think I give this three stars because I was like, some things actually were executed decently and a ton of things could have been executed really well, but like the author just like didn't quite know how to do it, I guess, or, or something, I don't know. It was just like, oh, you like had a thing here. You like, you set it up, you like teed it up to have something cool here and then you just like didn't. Um, so I don't think I'll read the rest of the series. Um, but it's not the worst. <laughs> and that is the worst, the noise. Okay, whatever. Um, back to finishing this project. <laughs> well, I finished Kingdom of Gods. Gods, not the gods. Kingdom of Gods by N.K. Jemisin, which concludes the Inheritance Trilogy. That's right, it's called, right? Not the Inheritance Cycle is something else. <laughs> anyway, um, I did like this slightly better than... Um, Broken Kingdom, Kingdoms, the second one. But both the second and the third one, this included, I, are nothing like and don't hold a candle to the 100,000 Kingdoms. Maybe if I reread 100,000 Kingdoms, I would hate it. I hope that that's not true. I, I don't plan on rereading it anytime soon and I have a pretty good memory of it. Um, I meant in terms of like goodness, like quality, uh, not like detailed memory, but I feel like I remember it decently well. I just feel like the second one in particular felt very like heavy on like, well, I, I mean, I talked about it in a clip. This one had some of that, definitely more of it than I want, less of it than book two. Thematically, this one felt like it had kind of like more going for it. Um, but even then, 
it like I just really struggle with like immortal beings and godlike beings and and un inhuman things um when when books and movies tv shows will be like well the only way that we can make this relatable is if we make them actually be kind of like undeniably human in some way or like they'll make some point about how like it's like they, they can't conceive of something that doesn't have the kind of feelings that we might recognize and sympathize with and I just I find that extremely frustrating particularly if a book is not just kind of like a wish fulfillment romance if it's a wish fulfillment romance and okay the immortal being who's like actually like in love with a human like it's not particularly what I want to read but like I get what the appeal uh, the appeal of that is is you know you're reading this for escapism and and imagining like oh wouldn't it be lovely if you know whatever like that's that's what it's doing um again not my dream but like I understand why that would be something someone would want to read but this is like a more serious book this is more well I shouldn't say more serious that sounds very value judgmenty but like you know this is like purports to be something that's not about like wish fulfillment that's not about it's not about it's about something more or different or I don't know <laughs> something that is is trying to tell a story that doesn't make its decisions story wise based on what would be the most again wish fulfillmenty for the reader. So when it does stuff like that, um, like. There's just like a lot of that in books two and three. And I feel like the first book, The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms, one of the things that I really liked about it, or at least that I remember liking about it, was that even though it involved kind of like immortal godlike beings having some kind of more human foibles or human desires or human feelings, it was still done in a way where like they felt still so alien and so so inhuman in how they would go about that, that it still really worked for me. Um... And I feel like books two and three are not that way. Um, where I just, yeah, I, I just really struggle with that as, as like a way to write a story in the first place. And then I don't think it's done especially well here. I feel like it's pretty info dumpy. And I feel like the, the, the narrator, like the first, the first person POV who's like narrating the story to you, like over explains a lot and tells instead of shows and it's like trying to like couching it in this kind of like oh well I'm a godling and you're humans and I always forget that humans need things explained to them so that's right I should tell you blah 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 and I'm like that's still info dumping you like bookended it with these cutesy oh for you mortals here's some info dumps but it's like that doesn't make it better <laughs> kind of makes it worse which is just so surprising to me because like if there's one thing that the broken earth is known for um is that it doesn't hold your hand that it doesn't info dump that it kind of drops you in the middle and expects you to kind of swim and I, that's one of the things that I love so so much about it and then to read this which just constantly hand holds info dumps and wish fulfillments and I just I feel like two different authors wrote these books. There are certain things about it that I'm like, oh, these are themes she's interested in. So like, I do find like N.K. Jemisin in there, but the, it's just so wildly different from both what I experienced in Broken Earth and what I want to read. So I still love the Broken Earth and I still think it's brilliant. This is not it for me. So I still want to read more N.K. Jemisin. Um, again, this not what I'm looking for, but you know, hopefully the pendulum swings and, um, for example, the Dreamblood duology. Maybe it's more akin to Broken Earth. I have no idea. I have not read it. I will find out when I do read it. So anyway, that's not on the list for this TBR project, but I am frankly relieved to be done with this. I... this took forever to get through and I hated pretty much every minute of it. <laughs> so that's unfortunate. Well, I finished this a few days ago, actually. Um, but I've been sick, which you can probably still hear, so I was truly incapable of speaking without immediately coughing. Uh, now I can speak for a little bit without coughing. <laughs> so, this book, um, I started reading it when it came out, technically like the day before it came out, because my books were added early, and I was so excited for it, so I started it. And then, um, read like a hundred pages of it, which like, is barely scratching the surface. Um, this is where... This bookmark has lived for like four years. I haven't taken it out because like 
it's just, I don't know. It feels like it's been there so long that like it would be sacrilegious to like remove it. Like that's where it lives now. Um, which it won't live there for much longer because I'm going to get rid of this book because I hated it. So I, and I do like this bookmark, so I want to keep it. But for now it still lives there. Um, anyway, this is, book is terrible. <laughs> um, this book is one of the worst books that I've ever read. Um, made all the worse by the atrocious length of it, which it is in no way justified. Um, I would hold this book up as, a uh, an obvious example of like all the things that you should not do as an author. So it's quite disheartening to me how popular this book is, that it's got like a quite high aggregate rating on Goodreads. I think if it didn't win, it was certainly nominated for the Goodreads Choice Awards, which granted doesn't like mean all that much. Like the Goodreads Choice Awards is, is whatever. And awards in general is, you know, who knows how much that means about anything ever. Um, but in general, like when I hear people talk about this book, it is mostly praise or people being like, ah, it was a bit long and boring. It's not maybe my favorite book ever. I was a little disappointed. But I don't really see anyone saying, oh my god, that book is garbage. <laughs> like, I'm not saying I'm the only person to say that. Certainly not. There is a smattering, you know, of one-star reviews on Goodreads. It's not like there isn't a single one. But, like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like uh, I read something like this knowing how well it was received. And I'm like, well, this is why we can't have nice things. Because... If people read this and think this is good writing, how are we ever going to get good writing if people are happy about this? I feel a little, if you've ever seen, this book is enormous, I'm putting it down. Um, David Mitchell, who is one of my absolute favorite comedians, I mean the British comedian, not the author, which is kind of confusing sometimes. Um, David Mitchell's rant about Downton Abbey. Um, I didn't feel that passionately about Downton Abbey, so I didn't really care, but I did know what he was talking about. Like I, I understood where he was coming from and it's how I feel about other things. Um, he has this rant that I'll briefly summarize. He's much funnier um, when he doesn't. But he was talking about how the season one of Downton Abbey was like nothing to write home about, but like, you know, entertaining enough, pretty well written, pretty well acted, you know, costumes are nice. It's, you know, it's shot um, well, you know, like it's, it's well put together and the story is decent and like there's nothing really to complain about too much. Like it's, it's perfectly fine and, you know, enjoyable. Um, and then season two came out, and not only did it continue to please people, people liked it just as much as, if not better than, season one. And he's, like, horrified and appalled by this because he's like, well, apparently it doesn't matter if you have good quality writing or good quality storytelling or good quality whatever, because apparently people don't give a shit. So, like, what's the point of even making an effort to make something quality when they, in fact, like it better when it's less good quality. And he, like, goes into detail about, like, why season two of Downton Abbey is, like, a shit show um, from, like, a, from writing continuity and historical, um, like, uh, credulity um, perspectives. And it's quite funny when he does it. And, again, I don't care that much about Downton Abbey. Like, I never really, like, I liked the show. I think I watched the first two, three seasons, something like that. Um, but not, like... I wasn't paying that much attention to it. Like, it was just, like, vibes, you know? And I will talk about Priory in a second. But to me, I didn't really pay that much attention to it. I was like, oh, it's, like, butlers and cakes and, and Maggie Smith being Maggie Smith. So I am actually kind of the person that David Mitchell is ranting about because he's like, apparently people don't care if it's good. They just want, like, you know, old-timey hats and, and Maggie Smith being, you know... Um, sarcastic and I'm like that is what I watched it for um, I wasn't actually like that invested in it there's other stories that I care that much more about and if they go off the rails Game of Thrones <laughs> then I care a great deal um, so anyway um, that being said when he's like you know can't understand how people like you know it seems that they approve of quality because they like season one of Downton Abbey but then when Downton Abbey is bad they still like it so quality wasn't the thing and this is why we can't have nice things so that's how I feel about Prior to the Orange Tree and, and I know it's slightly different because it's not like book one was good and book two was sucks or something I've, I'm obviously not gonna read book two um which is a prequel I believe which never bodes well it is stunningly gorgeous just like I mean this cover god I wish I liked this book this is one of the most stunning books I've ever seen fantasy books should look like this like, this is what I want on my shelf. I mean, I love the color orange. It's my favorite. But also just, like, the dragon and the foiling and the... Oh, like, this is just so stunning. I want this to be my favorite book because I want to display it prominently on my shelf. But no, it's awful. And book two's cover is also stunning. <clears throat> so why does Priory suck so much? For a lot of really, really basic reasons. Like, there's... I am thinking about doing a whole separate video just about Priory sucking. Um... 
So I don't know. I might do that. Let me know if you care. Um, that might influence my decision. Um, but basically, like, it's a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing. Like, having a book that's that long... It needs to justify its length. And I think a lot of people were like, well, because it's a standalone rather than a series and like, oh, isn't that nice for once it's not a series? Like, well, then it needs to be like pretty monstrously long to kind of like cover all the ground that normally a series has the space to do. So like 800 pages is like not that long if you think of it as like a trilogy that's all in like one book or something like that. And like broadly, generally, hypothetically, like I don't care if a book is 800 pages. I don't care if a book is 2000 pages. As long as, like, there's a good reason for it to be that long. There's, it's, it's rare that I think that uh, a book needs to be that long. I think quality writing tends to be shorter. I think that, like, knowing what you need to say and saying it efficiently shows more talent than just going on and on and on and on. But that doesn't mean that I never think, like, basically, I think that a book that's a thousand pages, it should be a thousand pages because that is the shortest possible length that it could be. Because, like, it was 2,000, and it was chopped down to the very essentials, which is a 1,000 pages, if that makes sense. I don't want a 1,000-page book because we just kind of, like, didn't cut anything. Like, <laughs> that I don't like. And as much as I will complain about books that, you know, show rather, or that tell rather than show, which is, like, an easy thing that everyone says, um, like, obviously, you know, you should show, not tell. Um, but having something just take 800 pages does not mean like I don't there's like a I kind of hate adages like that just because like there's a time and a place or people misunderstand it or misconstrue it it's like oh well uh, that means I can't just like sum up something that's not that important I have to spend 100 pages showing this thing because then I'm showing and not telling it's like yeah but is it significant enough to warrant 100 pages or is it something that just kind of like generally might be good to know um and once we know it we can kind of move on like, when people say show, not tell, they mean, like, if a character feels sad, you should show them in various scenes behaving in a way that indicates to the audience that they're probably sad, rather than having your narrator say this character is sad. Like, that's what that means. It doesn't mean every single thing in your book, you need to, like, show it, as opposed to ever telling anybody anything. And that's the thing that kills me, too, is books that misunderstand it so badly, they also tell instead of showing the things that they should be showing. So... There is an egregious lack of character development in here. And there, I mean, there's a ton of characters, I suppose, just in terms of, like, the number of individual people. But, like, actual characters that you're supposed to care about, that, like, who are, like, point of views or significant or, like, main characters, there's not actually that many. And I can't tell you anything about them other than, like, the bullet points of, like, where they are, what their job is, who they have a romance with. Like, they're not people. They're not, like, driven, motivated, feeling things. And, like, if they are, those are the things that are told to us rather than shown. Like, there's there's a sapphic romance in here that I knew of. I knew that was one of the many, not the only reason, but one of many things people cited as, like, why this book is so good. And that, like, oh, we love a sapphic romance in a high fantasy, how great. And, like, again, hypothetically, sure, yeah, an 800-page book that, like, needs to be 800 pages because it's so dense and that has a sapphic romance and dragons, like, sure, that sounds fantastic. But even though I knew this romance existed and knew, therefore, to be on the lookout for, like, okay, so who's it gonna be, uh, even though I was pretty sure I did know, um, it comes out of nowhere. And not in a way where I was shocked, um, like, actually shocked. I was just, like, yeah, like, I knew to look for this, and I still didn't, like, like, see the signs for it. And so when it happens, it's not like it's, it's felt like it's been burning and, and finally happening. It's like it literally was like the author was like, oh, and now is the time when we have that happen. So the author, so the, the characters, like, realize it in this scene because I need them to. Um, so it's just badly done. And for people who are calling this book feminist, okay, no, just because there's a queen in your book, just because there's a sapphic romance in your book, that does not make it feminist. I would frankly argue, so people were, okay, this also drives me insane. Um, it drives me insane that people compare everything to Game of Thrones because that's ridiculous. But also specifically this one, like more than I think other books, more intentionally compared itself to Game of Thrones, or at least I'm not saying that like Samantha Shannon did that, but like 
that was part of the discourse. It wasn't just the like, oh, every book gets stamped with, oh, this is Game of Thrones, meets whatever. People were saying this is like a feminist response to Game of Thrones. Like if you like the like um, world building and lore and politics and, and the death and the complexity of Game of Thrones, but like George R. R. Martin is like a misogynist and you want like the feminist version of that, which again, sure. Um, in general, if like that's the project of something, that sounds like it has potential. Um, I would argue that Robin Hobbs or Robin the Elderlings and fits that bill more than this. But I would also argue that frankly George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series has more actual feminism in it than this. Because in order for something to be feminist, it's not again just having a female character in it and then you gave her a dagger or you made her a queen. But your society is extremely misogynistic. Your female characters are shallow and have no depth or personality. They have nothing driving them, nothing to make them compelling. There's like <sighs> complexity in this world is simply just like over description and tons of like unnecessary detail about things that does nothing, contributes nothing, it doesn't sound believable. The way that the story, the politics, the world building, the characterization is is conveyed to the reader is through characters walking around like like cardboard cutouts who just like just come out and say what their motivations are, come out and say what their political position is and what the various factions are and why they align with a certain one. And like that is not how people work. That is not how politics works. In fact, people who are engaging in politics will, the one thing they'll never do is tell you what they actually think. And the fact that these characters are walking around being like, well, this faction is this over here and I'm in this faction and therefore, of course, the thing that I believe is the opposite of this and I will stand for that and die for that and we're doing politics right now. Like, no. Littlefinger in A Song of Ice and Fire is doing politics. Whatever he tells you, you can be fairly certain that what he actually thinks, it may not be the opposite, but it's definitely not what he just told you. That's politics. That's machinations. That's complexity. Because people, even people who are not as conniving as Littlefinger in A Song of Ice and Fire, people rarely themselves know exactly what's driving them or exactly why they feel the kind of way that they do in order to be able to just come out and tell you that. Um, be it about personal relationships and feelings, be it again about politics or about there's supposedly religious complexity in, in this book. But again, one, it's conveyed clumsily in these kind of like these like info dumps where someone is like, you know, oh yes, person of this religion who believes this. Yes, I am of this religion, but what I also believe is this. Like it's, no one talks like that. No one thinks like that. That's a horrible way to do your exposition. Um, but again, there's a lot more religious complexity in A Song of Ice and Fire, where there are multiple religions that all have like interesting um, kind of a uh, cognitive dissonances and the way they kind of coexist and how people can kind of like have a foot in both camps sometimes, which is a lot more kind of like reminiscent of real history when people, when there are countries that are kind of going from re one religion to another or when two cultures are clashing and so these religions have to kind of coexist. Like the way people make that make sense for themselves, be it in terms of like politics and like lawmaking or just the individual who's trying to relate to other people the way people make that make sense isn't to be like the thing I believe is this but what I make allowance for is this because that's compatible with my belief like people don't think like that or talk like that it's like I, I just it's it's awful and then the plot itself like the plot in this book does not take 800 pages it would take 100 pages like a good writer could knock it out in 100 pages. And I would be delighted by an extra 700 pages of quality, intricate, fascinating characterization, if that's what this is. Because like, arguably, um, The First Law by Joe Abercrombie, that plot for the all three books could also be knocked out in like one to 200 pages. Um, but what we get is like glorious in-depth characterization. And that's what most of the page count is devoted to, an actual politics. Um, and I'm so here for that. So again, 800 pages, that's like, maybe not terribly like, maybe there isn't 800 pages of plot. I frankly would be exhausted by that. Um, but is 800 pages that's justified because it's doing something with it. Um, I'm here for it. But this is not it. And if people think this is good, if people think this is what a feminist version of A Song of Ice and Fire is, like, please, like, you're like, insulting feminism. Because just because you stuck some women in it does not make it feminist. There is a female queen in A Song of Ice and Fire. So, you know, same. That makes it feminist, right? Actually, there's more than one. So it's more feminist. 
Um, yeah, I just, I'm tired of those comparisons in general. And this was truly one that, again, it's not like Samantha Shannon was like, hey guys, look what I did. I wrote a feminist response to, like, she didn't, as far as I know, do that. But that that's the rhetoric that was surrounding this book. I remember people said that also about Outlander when the show came out, that like, I think it was more about the show than the books where they were like, because this is a big, like, um, pr like premium cable type adaptation, um, like prime time that like, oh, Outlander, the show is like the feminist response to Game of Thrones, the show, which is also like, again, A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones is more feminist than Outlander is. I'm sorry. Um, again, an insult to feminism. Um, so yeah, uh, not for me. This was, I mean, I'm glad I did it, I guess. It feels like an achievement, but I do not recommend and, um, shan't be reading the other book, which is stunning. God, it's so pretty. It almost makes me want to read it because I'm like, maybe this one's better, but it's, I know it's not. I know that. Um, so yeah, let me know if you want a more in-depth video about this. I'm happy to do it, but only if people want to see it, so... Um, but yeah, this was not it. <laughs> Demon Voices by Philip Pullman, I think is my favorite book from this project. Is that true? Yes, that's true. Because I've mostly hated all the books. I, like, I really liked Uriah Heep and this one. What else did I read for this project? Oh, Jade Legacy. Okay, no, Jade Legacy is probably, ah, I really do love this though. I don't know. Point is, this is so, 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 so good. Um, I just scratched myself. Um, Demon Voices, as it says, on stories and storytelling. This is nonfiction. This is similar to The View from the Cheap Seats by Neil Gaiman, which I adore. I like The View from the Cheap Seats a little bit better than this. I also like Neil Gaiman's, like, work. I just like Neil Gaiman as an author better than Philip Pullman. Um, so stands to reason. <laughs> But I really enjoy this collection so, so much. Because it's a collection of like, um, you know, four words and essays and speeches and articles and things, then um, he does sometimes repeat himself. That also happens in View from the Cheap Seats. Um, because oftentimes, you know, similar topics call for similar anecdotes or points. So he like recycles some of his points, um, which wouldn't be apparent to anyone that wasn't reading it together. You know, if you were just at those speeches or reading those four words, then you wouldn't be like, hey, you just told this story. Um, so, and, and that's not like constantly redundant. It's like a little redundant here and there. But yeah, I, I just, I love this so much. So he kind of covered, just like with View from the Cheap Seats, there's kind of a wide variety. He does less um, View from the Cheap Seats. I didn't mean this to be just a comparison between the two, but they are similar. View from the Cheap Seats has far more um, like four words for other books. Um, so Neil Gaiman talks a lot more about other books and other authors. Philip Pullman certainly does, both because there's four words for other stories or speeches he gave in honor of other authors in this collection, but also because he just personally, you know, he has his own passions and influences, so he brings them up if and when necessary. Like, anyone that's read his Dark Materials will be unsurprised to learn that he brings up Paradise Lost more than once. <laughs> this didn't give the kind of, like, um, Reading View from the Cheap Seats made me want to pick up every book that Neil Gaiman was talking about. Here, that was like less of less of the thing in here at all. Um, that's not really so much what's going on in this. Um, but yeah, his some of it is musings on like writing craft, like how to approach writing. His ideas of what fantasy or speculative fiction is and isn't, should or should not be, why he does and does not like it. Um, uh, about philosophy, about his own kind of like journey on the faith spectrum and morality and its role um, in storytelling, whether it should be there, shouldn't be there, if it is there, how it should be there, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I just found it fascinating, compelling, interesting, thought provoking. Some of the things that he's talking about here, um, it's stuff that like I've kind of like talked about with people, you know, in lives and podcasts and videos and stuff. Um, some of it is stuff that kind of like, I was like, oh, I've like talked about this with people, but he said like he went further or he said it better or he said more. Um, and it kind of made me, it kind of like crystallized things that I'd kind of like danced around a little bit. Um, I love his metaphor um, for storytelling being like, um, like the, the world is the wood and the storyteller is like, writing the path through the wood. Um, 
and he, the way I just said it probably doesn't sound that great, but he bring, comes back to that metaphor a lot. Um, and I really, really think it's um, a good way of thinking of it. Not the only way, certainly, but it also, hearing him talk about kind of his approach to storytelling and what he does and does not value in it, um, it's, if you have read his Dark Materials, which I recommend you do, if you've never read his Dark Materials, I don't think you should read this first because he does feel um, at liberty to spoil his Dark Materials because then what's in here is, you know, like responses to criticisms about his Dark Materials or like articles when people ask questions about it when he's like responding to like people who are like, what was your point? Like, what were you trying to say with his Dark Materials and him like trying to respond to that? Um, but yeah, I... I feel like I'm going to return to this kind of like with maybe more so. View from the Cheap Seats, I think I enjoyed more in terms of just like, um, just as a reading experience. Like it was very emotional and, and it was thought provoking, certainly. Um, so I just felt very immersed in it. And it's like lovely to be with Neil. This book, immensely enjoyable, but I think is more one that I'll return to in a more practical sense. Like his approach to storytelling and his approach to world building, his approach to character building, his approach to the speculative, uh, whether or not to include it. Um, just so many things like that that are, I mean, he talks about them quite conversationally, but they're quite um, instructive ways of thinking about things. Not that you have to adopt his methods, but just to consider his approach to it and think about what that might mean for how you would approach a story as a reader or as a writer. Um, and so... I think I will find myself coming back to this both for enjoyment and for, um, you know, for, again, for practical reasons, um, to improve my writing craft and, and reading craft, if it can be called that, um, because how you approach a story, how you dissect it, how you value it, um, is shaped by kind of like what you bring to it. And he talks about that a lot as well. Um, so yeah. I also, I mean, I've read his Dark Materials twice. This kind of makes me want to read it a third time. Um, again, I don't think you should read it before having read it, but having already read it and now hearing kind of some of his thoughts on what he wanted to do with it, what he ultimately did do with it, things that he would do about it differently now, um, to reread his Dark Materials kind of through that lens now. I don't think that's like he himself would object to that being the only lens through which to view something. He's very much against the idea of, like, the author being the final authority on the meaning of a text, um, which I tend to gravitate towards authors who have that attitude, <laughs> uh, towards have the attitude that that's not the attitude to have, it. yeah, who'd, who'd remove themselves from the analysis um, as much as is reasonable. Um, it's not the death of the author, I don't think that's appropriate, and I don't think he does, but that the author is just, like, one of the many people who have a perspective on what the text means that it can be engaged with like kind of democratically like um you can take into consideration what the author has to say about what they wanted to do thought they did etc um and take it or leave it you shouldn't like categorically ignore it and you shouldn't take it as gospel like it's just another piece of the puzzle of what you think this text might mean um <laughs> So anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed this, thoroughly recommend it, um, and he's quite clear about what his positions are about things, but I don't feel preached to in this book, if that makes sense. Like, he makes good arguments, or he makes strong arguments, or those are all kind of value judgments. He makes maybe forceful arguments, I would say, for what he personally feels, um, what his experience has been, the conclusions he's arrived at. But I don't think, um, again, just like with he doesn't believe that he as the author is the the um, ultimate um, authority on what his text means, I don't think he regards himself as the ultimate authority on any of the questions that he engages with. These are his perspectives. These are his conclusions. And um, I think, if anything, this is an invitation to debate with him. Um, not, obviously, like, literally inviting you over to his house to debate with him. But, you know, it's an invitation to engage with these ideas. He's like, here's what I think about this. And I'm not going to be like, well, this is what I think. He's like, look, this is what I think. And I, you would have to con have a strong argument to convince me otherwise. This is what I think. But I don't, again, feel like he's saying, and if you think something different from this, you're stupid. Like, that is not the vibe. In fact, um, in one of the, uh, I forget if it's a, an essay or a speech, but um, after each piece, he also provides like a little afterward about 
the where this came from or what he was writing it for or whatever. Um, and in one of the pieces that got into a little bit more, you know, like religious subject matter, um, he talked about um, the Archbishop, I think, at Oxford. Is that the right title slash place? I don't know. A real, very like a religious office holder that he had a good relationship with and how um, that was one of his favorite people to debate with. So presumably based on that person's occupation, they would hold, if not the exact opposite view, but definitely an opposing view to his. Um, which I think the inclusion of things like that is basically, again, him saying, look, this is what I think and I think it's fun to debate it. And so if I'm debating it with you, like, here are my positions, here are my arguments. But, you know, sure, like, if you've got a better one, if you think differently, lay it on me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, yeah, I found it very thought provoking, very enjoyable. Found it very thought provoking, very enjoyable, and I do recommend it. And I do, again, for anyone that um, feels about things very, very differently from Philip Pullman, I don't think that precludes you from reading this book. I don't think he would want it to preclude that. Um, he's just telling you what he thinks. Um, I don't think he's making a case for him being the authority, because he's very much against the idea of any one person having the right idea. Um, so, yeah. I think if you're at all interested in his ideas and his approach to storytelling and generally um, the subject of how does one approach storytelling, he talks about C.S. Lewis and Tolkien pretty disparagingly, if I'm honest. And he's pretty upfront about that. Like one of um, the pieces in particular where he goes after Tolkien, he pre like at the big outset of that piece, he's like, I'm going to be talking some shit about Tolkien. Basically. He doesn't phrase it like that. That's basically what he's saying. He's like, hey, buckle up. Like, I'm about to be talking shit about Tolkien, so y'all are going to be super pissed at me. But, you know, I'm just telling you what I think and what my experience has been. So, again, I don't think he's making an argument for the fact that Tolkien sucks and you should think he sucks and that anyone who likes Tolkien's an idiot. That is not at all the um, impression that I get from it. It's just that this is his experience of reading Tolkien and why it did or did not work for him or what it was lacking for him or what it would be that he would specifically not want to emulate in his own work, etc. And I think it's valuable to hear that other perspective. I think so many authors like Tolkien are kind of treated um, with kid gloves, where like, they're just, um, they're such like pillars of the genre, they're untouchable. And if you dare to criticize them, it's like, oh, well, you weren't smart enough to get it. Or clearly fantasy isn't for you. And he'd be the first to say fantasy is not for him. <laughs> uh, and then he, but he's written quite a lot of speculative fiction. Um, and that's kind of his point. He's like, it's a little bit like Abercrombie, um, although Abercrombie does really like Tolkien. Um, Philip Pullman being saying that he thought that he didn't like speculative fiction because he didn't like Tolkien. And he's like, well, that's supposed to be like the big one, the best one, and I don't like it. So I don't think I like fantasy. Um, and his realization that like, oh, it, it doesn't have to actually mean that. And actually a lot of the fiction that he does like is actually speculative. It's just like not what you think of when you say like fantasy, but he has actually no objection to speculative elements. He just didn't like Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so I think it's refreshing to hear a, an author feel free to be like, I don't like Tolkien. <laughs> like, and that's okay. It's okay to say that and it's okay to disagree with that. So yeah, it, it, feels, very, it feels very authentic and unvarnished and very true. Um, this is what he thinks and feels and how he approaches things. And that's just, it is what it is. Um, and he invites you to engage with that as a perspective. So I, again, I highly, highly recommend this. Um, even if you, I don't agree with everything. I like, um, I like the Lord, of, the Lord of the Rings. But hearing why he dislikes it gave me food for thought about like a new way to look at Lord of the Rings and, and to... Um, you know, wonder like, is that actually maybe a flaw in it? Maybe it's a flaw that's not as important to me, uh, so I can overlook it. Or do I disagree? Do I think that that's not a flaw that's present in Lord of the Rings? But invited me to engage with that subject, with the Lord of the Rings, in a way that I hadn't before. And even if I don't reach the same conclusion as Philip Pullman, the, the opportunity to kind of get this kind of uh, blowing the cobwebs off of Lord of the Rings and, and actually looking at it a little bit differently is not really something that you get much of a chance to do because the book is closed on that. The Lord of the Rings is a masterpiece. That's agreed. And that's just, there's nothing further to be said about the subject. So it's interesting to kind of like revisit it and be like, hey, no, wait a second. What if 
What if it's not perfect? So, yeah. Highly, highly recommend. And the last book. I just finished Leviathan Wakes by James S.A. Corey, which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, at least one of the, I think it's a duo of authors. It's a duo of authors, one of which I believe is Daniel Abraham. Is that his name? Um, the author of the Long Price Quartet, which I did not like. Uh, and then another author. I don't know who the other author is. I'm pretty sure that's the case. Any um, yeah, I wanted to read this for, I mean, the whole, this whole project was books that I'd wanted to read for one reason or another. But this, I guess Priory might be like the one that has like been around on my want to read list for the longest, but this might be second longest. Um, I owned the audiobook for the last five years or so. And then I got, I think I said this in the original video that I got the physical copy as kind of like a, one as a reminder that, hey, that's a book that you have that you wanted to read. And also, because I struggled to get into the audiobook. Um, so I thought I should maybe try reading it physically. So I read this partially physically, partially on audio. Um, so I started like, um, like to get into it, I did it physically. And then like once I got my bearings, then I could do the audio as well. And I enjoyed this. Um, I do want to continue the series. I don't love it. Like it's not like my new favorite. Um, as far as sci-fi series go, um, I probably prefer the Sun Eater and Red Rising and even Mickey Seven. Um, I really like Mickey Seven. Um, but that being said, I think this is really good. Um, I think my main issues with it are just kind of like things that that are much less bad than in the Long Price Quartet. Um, things about like how the narration is done um, that I, I, I guess I blame Daniel Abraham. Um, like the, exp the exposition and the characterization is a bit clunky, a bit telling over showing, um, things like that. Like the way that the world building is conveyed is often quite like, and then he made a gesture that was indicative of like where he comes from, uh, a gesture that nobody from this other place would ever make. Like it's just really clunky when it does stuff like that and it takes me out of the story. That being said, in the Long Price Quartet, um, it's been a minute since I read, well, I only read the first book, but I remember not only was it clunkily delivered, but I also thought it was quite dumb. And like the world building didn't make a ton of sense, um, neither like in isolation nor like as a cohesive whole that's meant to work together. Um, so it was like the double whammy of like, you're telling it badly and then what you're telling me is dumb. So here, I think you're kind of telling it to me badly, but it was, it was more interesting and more like it made more sense um, in terms of how the world might be. Still a few things here and there that I was like, uh, I don't know. I don't know that that's how that would be. Um, and like, again, it's kind of nitpicky things, like things about characterization where like um, to, to, in order to like make the point that a character is not reacting emotionally in a situation that another, that more, that the majority of people either would react emotionally to or would think that you would react emotionally to, that character has to like self-awarely observe that like, wow, they're being unemotional about this when other people would be really emotional, which is not a thing that people would necessarily do. Certainly not in the moment, maybe after the fact, but like it's more likely something that someone else would remark on or notice because they themselves are emotional or were emotional or would expect to be and are looking at this person and going, wow, you're not emotional. So having the person themselves being like, uh, you know, like, uh, he like observed to himself how unemotional he was about this thing. And it's like, would he though? Like, someone who's not reacting emotionally to something doesn't tend to observe the fact that they are reacting unemotionally to something. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's just weird. Like, it just feels like the author wants you to know this thing and is like clunkily inserting a way for the character to have thought about it or to have pointed it out. It's kind of like the thing of, it wasn't doing this necessarily, but it's kind of the thing of characters that talk on and on about how badass they are and everything that they've done. Um, when in fact, like characters that probably have like killed a lot of people probably wouldn't want to talk about it um, unless they're like, is doing a sales pitch for work as a mercenary or something, which is something I think that like Joe Abercrombie, haven't brought him up in a minute, does quite well, you know, where characters that actually are really lethal killers kind of like downplay it and like don't talk about it. And characters that like want to have the reputation of that talk about it all the time, but like 
when it comes down to it, they actually aren't that like lethal or experienced or whatever, which is like more, not like a hundred percent of the time. I'm not saying there's never been a person who's a killer that wanted to brag about it, but that's the kind of thing where it's like, well, how do I tell the reader that this character is such a massive killer unless they're like bragging about it or like reflecting on it or whatever it is. And it's just almost never feels authentic. Um, to either what a character would say or do or or it, it like makes me not believe that about them makes it feel forced so the book was guilty of that type of thing quite a lot where characters are like being weirdly self-aware of things and pointing it out to the reader so that you know that about them and I just wish authors in general would just trust that if you show the character doing these things in these various situations that the reader themselves will notice it or at the very least have other characters be the ones to notice it to be like wow he's not reacting emotionally to this which is like kind of creepy or weird or unusual not have the character themselves do it um so like that's just it's not always to do with like emotions but like that's the type of thing that this book constantly does where the a thing that a character is feeling or experiencing or, or how they're what they're saying, what they're doing, what their thought process is on something, they themselves comment on how it differs from the norm or how it differs from the lay person or whatever it is. And it's just like, it's weird <laughs> and it feels clunky. Again, that being said, I did think the situation and the politics and the world building of this like space opera was like quite intricate and compelling and the way that the kind of mystery, the way we kind of like peel back the layers of the onion of what's going on, I think is is very interesting and also I think there's a lot of moving pieces to it and I think maybe that the very very outset when you're like totally don't have your bearings which was me when I first started the audiobook and couldn't do it um because you just like don't know what the status quo is at all so you're learning all new information but like that being said I think once you're kind of into it I think it does a pretty good job of like telling you this story in a way where you can keep track of the factions and you're not kind of like lost in the mire of like who is who are the interested parties um so yeah I think it's well done overall despite my nitpicks and it, it makes me want to read the next one I know there's like 10 books I think people have said that they're not all like there's like I don't know if it comes back up again but I know this was really kind of a drop and hopefully it comes back up again I don't really know but um yeah I liked this um and I'm glad to have finally read it <laughs> Um, yeah, and that is the last book that I had for this project. I did it uh, in the 11th hour, but I did it. And that feels um, great. I thought there for a second that I wouldn't be able to do it, but I, but I did it. I did it. So, you know, I uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Um, it has been basically a year since my first clip. Uh, what was the first book I finished? Wolf Hall, I think. Plus, or Essex Serpent, one of those two, I think. Um, it wasn't a, a super great um, in terms of, like, finding books that I like. I, I think the majority I ended up disliking. Let's see. I liked Leviathan Wakes. So that's a good note to end on. But, um, and I liked The Unlikely Escape. And I liked Jade Legacy, which we all knew that I would. And I liked The Secret Commonwealth. And, um... I liked uh, the other poem in um, Demon Voices. So like, not quite half, but nearly half. Certainly not half by page count, because Briary, you know, really tips the scales, but yeah. Glad to have done this and like gotten some things off of, off of the list. Knocked them out, be done. Especially ones I disliked, because now they're not crowding my shelves. So yeah. Um, yeah, let, let me know things, stuff. I don't, at this point, I don't remember what all I've said about all the books as I finished them, but whatever your thoughts are about my reactions to them, if you agree with me or disagree with me, whatever. Um, if you like this style of video, I didn't anticipate it would take me like the full year to get this done, but you know, here we are. So um, if you'd like other such projects in the future, let me know. And um, yeah, I'll see you when I see you.